Welcome back to Bombastic Nation and Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Jan and I'm back with some more vibes for all you. And this one here is a, a Napoleon Endgame, France 1814. So we're coming down to like the end of the Napoleon era and thing like that. So, you know, I ain't going to keep you all for too long. Thank you all for commenting. Uh, uh, go ahead and keep commenting and suggesting things to watch. And I'll watch it because I like watching it. And I'll have you watch it with me. So you're going to see, you know, what I man say and thing and thing. You know what I mean? Let's go ahead and YouTube and Sim Sim and see what I'll go on with the Napoleon Endgame. Uh, ominous music. Peace, peace. It's easy enough to say the word. Am I to give all that I possessed in, in Germany? In October 1813, Napoleon had suffered his heaviest ever defeat at Leipzig, the Battle of the Nations. Surviving French forces, exhausted, sick and demoralized, retreated to the River Rhine and prepared to defend France from invasion. It's getting real. In November, the armies of the Sixth Coalition paused their advance, and Austrian Foreign Minister Metternich offered peace terms. The Frankfurt proposals would allow Napoleon to keep his throne if France returned to her so-called natural frontiers. It was the best offer Napoleon was likely to get, now that his back was to the wall, and all Europe's great powers were united against him. Even so, he did not accept the terms. He merely agreed to reopen negotiations. To the Allies, and many in France itself, it proved that Napoleon would not listen to reason. <laughs> the war went on, and by January 1814, Napoleon's situation looked even worse. Many of his besieged garrisons in the east were starved into surrender. Marshal Davout, with 34,000 men in Hamburg, was now besieged. Denmark, one of France's last allies, was invaded by Bernadotte's Swedish army and made to join the coalition. French troops evacuated the Netherlands, which reasserted its independence after nearly 20 years of French Slowly control. but surely. In Italy, Eugène's army faced a new enemy. Joachim Murat, King of Naples, now marching north with 30,000 men to honor his new alliance with the Sixth Coalition. In Paris, Napoleon responded to the crisis with a series of extreme measures. Property taxes doubled, state salaries and pensions suspended, 300,000 new conscripts called up. That would turn your people against you, wouldn't it? You're gonna raise taxes. How how do you sell how do you sell that? I don't know. Stuff like that works in modern times though, so you know. I'm not surprised. From a country already exhausted by twenty years of war. He ordered the release of Pope Pius, under French house arrest for the last five years, to try to shore up his support in Italy. He even agreed to release Fernando, the Bourbon King of Spain, to take up his throne in exchange for peace between France and Spain, a condition that Fernando was in no position to honor. But these concessions were too little, too or late. Too late. In January, two coalition armies crossed the Rhine into France. Blücher's army of Silesia and Schwarzenberg's army They're of Bohemia. Outnumbered French forces in their path could only fall back. On the 25th of January, Napoleon said farewell to his wife and son at the Tuileries Palace before leaving for the front. He would never see either of them again. Oh, wow. With just 70,000 men, he faced odds of four to one. 
Most of his troops were raw conscripts, some without uniforms. Benny just learning how to hold a musket. But for the first time in years, Napoleon's army was so small that he'd be able to exercise direct command over all its movements. The result would be one of the most audacious and brilliant campaigns in history. Wow, my man still got resolve. Imagine Napoleon waging war in the 20th century. His cavalry replaced by armored vehicles, cannon by attack helicopters, the old guard in heavy tanks, the emperor with air support. Napoleon learned that the coalition armies were widely scattered, with part of Blücher. If the enemy are foolish enough to cross the Rhine, I will uh, march to meet them. Then you will see the meaning of the word debacle. The battle for France would be fought east of Paris, the mostly barcle. across Champagne, a flat region divided by the rivers Marne and Seine. And Just a little Paris. light thing spinning in there. In late January, fields were dusted with snow and roads quickly turned to mud. Napoleon learned that the coalition armies were widely scattered, with part of Blücher's army near Napoleon's old college at Brienne. The Emperor advanced rapidly, hoping to trap and destroy part of Blücher's army. But after a hard day's fighting that cost both sides 3,000 casualties, Blücher was able to retreat towards Schwarzenberg's army. That evening, Napoleon was nearly skewered by a charging Cossack, saved only by General Gorgo's good shooting. As Napoleon tried to work out the enemy's movements, Blücher, heavily reinforced by Schwarzenberg, made a surprise attack at La Rothière. La Rothière. Love the pronunciation. Our troops advanced through swirling snow to assault the village defiantly held by young French conscripts. One was so inexperienced that Marshal Marmont had to personally show him how to load his musket during the battle. By late afternoon, Vreda's Bavarian Corps was falling on Napoleon's flank. Heavily outnumbered, Napoleon had no option but to retreat, having lost 5,000 casualties. 73 guns abandoned in the thick mud. The Allies' frontal attacks meant their losses were greater, but by combining their armies, they defeated Napoleon on French soil for the first time. Oh man. Believing Napoleon would now retreat towards Paris, the Allies decided to advance along two routes to ease pressure on the roads. Blücher would take a northern route along the Marne. Schwarzenberg would follow the Seine. But dividing their armies again would play right into Napoleon's hands. The study of it has given me a greater idea of his genius than any other, the Duke of Wellington. After two days to reorganize, Napoleon continued his retreat to Nogent, where he learned that the Allies had split their armies. Not only that, they were advancing at different speeds. The aggressive Blücher racing ahead, while the more cautious Schwarzenberg lagged behind. Leaving Oudinot and Victor to guard the Seine bridges and delay Schwarzenberg, Napoleon raced north through mud and rain with 30,000 men. The army of Silesia was strung out on the march, oblivious to the danger it was in. First, Napoleon fell on General Osufiev's Russian 9th Corps at Champaubert, destroying it, taking its commander and 2,000 men prisoner. Oh, man. The next morning, he marched on General Austin Sacken's force near Montmirail. This was a much larger force, with two infantry and one cavalry corps and was expecting support from York's Prussian First Corps. But the Prussians were late, and Sacken's troops could not withstand the French onslaught. 
At this desperate hour, the Emperor's elite Gold Guard were no longer held back, but were often thrown into the thick of the fighting. By the end of the day, Napoleon had inflicted another 3,500 casualties, twice his own losses. The Allies were in rapid retreat. Napoleon had ordered Marshal Macdonald to cut off the enemy's escape by seizing the Marne Bridge at Chateau Thierry. But York's Prussians got there first. The next day, Napoleon could only batter their rear guard as the enemy fled across the Marne, destroying the bridge behind them. Sending Marshal Mortier to rebuild the bridge and continue the pursuit, Napoleon doubled back to rejoin. Can you imagine? Because, you know, they, they're retreating and stuff. They have to be leaving people behind after they blow up the bridge. That's that's a hell of a decision to make. You know what I mean? Hey, to save the, the, the majority, let's just blow up the bridge and leave whoever it is behind. And you have to know that they're leaving wounded people as they retreat behind. It's crazy. Marmo who had been left to keep watch on Luca. Napoleon attacked at Vauchon, using General Grouchy's cavalry to outflank Blucher's army, which was soon in headlong retreat. A merciless French pursuit inflicted 6,000 Russian and Russian casualties. Napoleon lost just 600 men. Napoleon had taken on an enemy army almost twice his size and beaten it four times in just six days. Blücher had lost an estimated 15,000 casualties in battle and another 15,000 in smaller engagements as stragglers or deserters. For now, the army of Silesia had been scattered and neutralized. But in the south, Marshals Victor and Oudinot had not been able to prevent Schwarzenberg's Army of Bohemia from crossing the Seine in three places. Austrian troops were now just 40 miles from Paris. Leaving Mortier and Marmont to keep watch on Blücher, Napoleon raced south. He's just going back and forth. by news of Blücher's defeat and of Napoleon's approach, immediately ordered a retreat. It was too late for Wittgenstein's advance guard, routed at Montmain with 2,000 casualties. Napoleon sent Victor's second corps to seize the bridge at Montereau, but was so infuriated by its slow progress that he sacked Victor and gave his corps to General Gérard. The next day at the Battle of Montereau, the French drove the Allied Württemberg Corps back across the river with 30% losses. According to some accounts, the Emperor sighted the French cannon himself, as he had at Lodi 18 years before. Napoleon had the Allies on the run. But how long could it last? How long indeed? Recollect what your military position is. If we act with military and political prudence, how can France resist a just peace demanded by 600,000 warriors? Even as fighting continued, negotiations between France and the coalition reopened at Châtillon sur Seine on the 5th of February. The Allied terms were now more severe. A return to France's frontiers of 1791, which meant the additional loss of Belgium, a humiliation that Napoleon refused to accept. Instead, he tried to revive the Frankfurt proposals, hoping to play for time and to split the coalition, whose war aims varied from Britain's hard line to Austria's more ambiguous position. But this hope was thwarted by British Foreign Secretary Lord Castlereagh. On the 1st of March, he persuaded the Allies to sign the Treaty of Schumann. In it, Russia, Prussia, Austria and Great Britain agreed to keep 150,000 troops in the field and not to negotiate separately with France, while Britain added the sweetener of a £5 million subsidy 
to be shared among the Allies. The treaties Money talks. Articles specified common war aims, including the future independence of the German states, Switzerland and Italy, while Spain was to be returned to the Bourbons and Holland to the House of Orange. The four powers even agreed that once they'd defeated Napoleon, they'd form a 20-year defensive alliance to maintain peace in Europe, a sign of their newfound commitment to each other. A split in the coalition had been Napoleon's last best hope for a favorable peace. That was gone. That was thwarted. And news from across the country was bleak. French cities were surrendering to the Allies without a fight. Nancy, Dijon, and Macon had all fallen. In the south, Wellington defeated Marshal Soult at Ortez, forcing him to fall back on Toulouse. Two weeks later, as British troops approached the city of Bordeaux, it declared loyalty to France's Bourbon kings. The mayor himself rode out to greet the British, bearing a white cockade, the sign of Bourbon allegiance. Napoleon's hope for a nation in arms to resist the Allies had not materialized. Allied troops, particularly Cossacks, often robbed French civilians and committed some atrocities. French peasants took revenge when they could, but there was no guerrilla war to mirror what French troops had encountered in Spain or Russia. The chief desire among ordinary French people was for peace. But almost too much war, peace. brother. Dangers crowded upon him, encompassed him, oppressed him from every side, but he sought to escape from them by misrepresenting them to himself. Uh, a man in denial. The talk of Napoleon's defeat in late February was premature. The fr See, that's the thing, man. When, hmm, when people are subjected to war after war after war, after a while, somebody come in and they, say, they sense there might be some peace, they'll just say, all right, I'll do it. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, the people coming in will commit more atrocities than, uh, than the ones before. It's kind of like what happened in Afghanistan to a certain degree. Way back when, you know, then we got tired of war. You know, just let them come in. Bam. Total domination. The citizenry, the citizenry could get war weary, and they probably get war weary a lot quicker than the soldiers. A lot quicker. French Emperor was driving Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia before him, even though it was twice his size. But Schwarzenberg scrambled to safety behind the River Ohm. Napoleon knew he had to land another decisive blow soon, so turned his attention back to Blücher. After an aborted attempt to join forces with Schwarzenberg, Blücher had decided to resume his advance on Paris, gathering reinforcements en route, and with only Marmont and Mortier's weak corps to oppose him. Leaving Marshal Macdonald in command in the south, Napoleon set off to intercept Blücher, covering 60 miles in three days Ooh. along terrible roads choked with mud. Napoleon's approach, Blücher retreated across the Marne, burning the bridges behind him. 24 hours later, they'd been rebuilt by French engineers, and Napoleon was poised to crush Blücher against the Enne River, because the major crossing point at Soissons was held by a Franco-Polish garrison. But after just a day's fighting, the garrison commander at Soissons tamely surrendered allowing Blücher to escape. Napoleon <laughs> continued on by, bro. across the Enne, still hoping to cut off the army of Silesia. But at Craon, he encountered Russian troops in a strong defensive position. The Russians fought stubbornly. 
the French finally forced the enemy to withdraw, but only at the cost of 6,000 casualties, Ooh. including many irreplaceable veterans from Napoleon's guard. Napoleon pushed on to Lyon. But by now, Blücher had concentrated his forces, 98,000 troops in all, and outnumbered Napoleon two to one. French attacks were repulsed, while Marmont's corps was caught off guard by a late Allied counterattack and routed. Napoleon was lucky to avoid a much heavier defeat. Blücher, usually aggressive to the point of recklessness, was unwell and had been told Napoleon's army was twice as big as it was, leading him to act with unusual caution. Law was a heavy blow to Napoleon. Six and a half thousand casualties he could not afford. Undaunted, he fell back to Soissons. And after a brief moment to reorganize, he marched on the city of Reims, which had just fallen to Saint-Priest's Russian corps. In a whirlwind assault, Napoleon retook the city. Saint-Priest himself was mortally wounded, his corps routed. Meanwhile, in the south, Schwarzenberg had resumed his offensive as soon as he found out Napoleon had gone north. In heavy fighting, he'd driven Oudinot and Macdonald back from the River O. Five days later, the Allies had recaptured Troyes as Macdonald retreated behind the River Seine. Now, after four days to rest and reorganize his battered army, Napoleon was coming south once more. But he's just going everywhere trying to Schwarzenberg, coordinate stuff. Emboldened by news of Napoleon's defeat at Long, decided that this time he would stand and fight. Napoleon advanced on Arcis sur Aube, ignoring reports that the enemy was not retreating as he believed, but gathering for battle. As heavy fighting broke out, Napoleon still believed he faced only the enemy rearguard. It was a nasty surprise to discover that he faced the entire might of the army of Bohemia. 28,000 men against 80,000. In desperate fighting, Napoleon personally rallied fleeing troops and exposed himself to enemy fire, having his horse killed under him by an exploding shell. The odds were too great. At the end of the second day, Napoleon was forced to order the retreat. Wow. I saw the glorious dead disputing foot by foot. The soil of the country, the balls flew around me. My clothes were pierced, but none reached me. Napoleon believed his army was now too weak to take on the Allies directly. So he decided to change the strategy. He would march into the rear of the Allied armies, join up with some of his isolated garrisons, and cut the enemy's lines of communication, forcing them to abandon their advance on Paris. He's doing everything to stop them. But the Allies, until now always one step behind Napoleon, had just received crucial information. Talleyrand. The most brilliant French diplomat of the age, and the most slippery. He'd served France's monarchy, the Revolution, then Napoleon, until in 1807 he fell out irrevocably with the Emperor over foreign policy. He now believed that Napoleon was dragging France into ruin, and worked behind the scenes to ensure his downfall. Wow. From Paris, he wrote to the Russian Emperor From within. Alexander. Allied headquarters, informing him that in the capital, support for Napoleon was crumbling. And the city's yeah, defenses he, he raised taxes a thing. He urged the Allies to march immediately on Paris, without allowing Napoleon to distract them. 
Talleyrand's information was confirmed when the Allies intercepted a report from Napoleon's chief of police, General Savary, meant for the Emperor. The treasury, arsenals and powder stores are empty. We are completely at the end of our resources. The population is discouraged and discontented, wishing peace at any price. As Napoleon advanced on Saint-Dizier, the Allies sent General Witzingerode and 10,000 cavalry to harass his army and to screen their own movements. Then began their march on Paris. At Fair Champenoise, they collided with Marmont and Mortier's corps, advancing to join the Marmont is still around. An entire National Guard division, 5,000 men, was virtually wiped out as the marshals suffered a crushing defeat. Napoleon feared that the fall of Paris would be a fatal blow to his regime. His political authority and ability to wage war might not recover. So when he received news of the Allies' movements, he tore up his plans and ordered a forced march back to Paris, intending to lead its defense in person. So long way, brother. His wife and son were evacuated from the capital along with most of his ministers. His brother, Joseph, the ex-king of Spain, was in charge of the city's defences, but had done little. Paris was awash with rumours of treachery and defeat. Marmont and Mortier were able to reach Paris before the Allies, adding their troops to the garrison. It now totaled 37,000 men, including some hardened veterans of the Guard, but many more young conscripts, while a third were part-time soldiers of the National Guard. The Allies had 120,000 seasoned troops outside the city, and given the urgency of taking Paris before Napoleon could intervene, their elite guards and grenadier divisions would lead the way. On the 30th of March, they began their assault from the north. Heavy fighting raged throughout the day. The city's defenders fought bravely, inflicting several thousand casualties on the advancing enemy. But defeat was inevitable. That night, to save Paris from destruction, Marshal Marmont agreed to surrender the city. Wow. The garrison was permitted to leave with its weapons. At the Hotel des Invalides, the 71-year-old Marshal Servouillet oversaw the burning of 1,400 flags and standards captured from France's enemies, as well as Frederick the Great's sword and sash, so they would not fall into Allied hands. Napoleon was just 15 miles from Paris when he was informed of the city's surrender. He sat with his head in his hands for 15 minutes. We do not intend to expose Paris to the fate of Moscow. On the 1st of March 1814, France's enemies marched into Paris for the first time since the Hundred Years' War. Parisian crowds cheered the three Allied monarchs, bringers of peace. Everyone in Paris was suddenly a royalist once more. Above all, they cheered for Emperor Alexander of Russia, now hailed as Europe's saviour. Don Cossacks bivouacked on the Champs Elysees. Allied troops generally behaved well. Thirty-five miles away, Napoleon was at Fontainebleau with 36,000 men, all of them hungry and exhausted after their hundred-mile forced march. Nevertheless, 
Napoleon began planning an immediate advance on Paris. But for the first time, he faced unanimous opposition from his ministers and marshals, including Ney, MacDonald, Oudinot, and Berthier. They reminded him of his oath to act for the good of France. He accused them of disloyalty, acting only to save themselves. They told him the war was lost, and he must abdicate in favor of his son, if possible. Wow. On the 4th of April, Marshal Marmont surrendered his entire corps to the coalition, which was marched over to the enemy lines against the wishes of many of its officers and men. This was a devastating blow to Napoleon and encouraged the Allies to reject his offer of a conditional abdication in favor of his son. Two days later, he abdicated without conditions. The Allied powers having proclaimed that the Emperor Napoleon is the only obstacle to the re-establishment of peace in Europe, the Emperor Napoleon, faithful to his oath, declares that he renounces for himself and his heirs the thrones of France and Italy, and that there is no personal sacrifice, including his life, that he is not ready to make in the interests of France. Napoleon's abdication was formalized by the Treaty of Fontainebleau, by which he was allowed to keep the title of Emperor, become sovereign of the small island of Elba, and retain a bodyguard of 400 men. News came too late to prevent Wellington's attack on Toulouse, leading to a costly and pointless battle with more than 7,000 casualties. Wow, they came that close. The night after his abdication, Napoleon tried to commit suicide using the poison that had been made for him in Russia in case of capture. But it had lost its potency, and he survived. Two weeks later, Napoleon bade farewell to his old guard at Fontainebleau Palace, and began his journey into exile. I have been wrong, maybe in my plans. I have done harm in war, but it is all like a dream. The Napoleonic Wars, which had raged on land and sea for 11 years, seemed finally at an end. The death toll is unknown, but historians estimate that two to three million lives Ooh. were lost across Europe. Most soldiers died not in battle, but from disease. Many thousands were left maimed and disfigured. For most of this period, Napoleon was master of Europe, imposing treaties on humbled enemies, redrawing frontiers, overthrowing old regimes, and making new kings. He was the last figure in history to combine total political power with frontline military genius, in the mold of Alexander and Caesar. But it seemed Napoleon's reign was to end in abject military defeat. However, exile on Elba did not prove to Napoleon's taste. In less than 10 months, he would return to France to fight one last great campaign to reclaim his throne. Ah, there is more. <laughs> you know, I heard of Napoleon. We did study him briefly in school back home. But I'm quite glad that I watched this whole series here because I got to go deep into it. You know what I mean? And, and, and see what the actual history was and the battles and stuff like that. This was quite educational, if I may say so myself. Uh, as usual, I'm leaving a link in the description for this video. You all could go... Uh, Check it out and go through the whole series if you if you just joining me and you haven't seen uh, the whole series here. You know what I'm saying and thing, but man, those times, man.
11 years of fighting, millions of men dying. It's crazy what we do to each other, isn't it? Anyway, man, thank you all for watching this with me. Go out there and take care of each other. Cool runnings, okay?